Oswald Chambers, so I send you page 105. The first thing God does with us after sanctification is to force through the channels of a single heart the interest of the whole world by introducing into us the nature of the Holy Spirit. The nature of the Holy Spirit is the nature of the Son of God. The nature of the Son of God is the nature of the Almighty God. And the nature of Almighty God is focused in John 3.16. When we are born from above, the realization dawns that we are built for God, not for ourselves. You have made me. We are brought, bought, brought by means of a new birth into the individual realization of God's great purpose for the human race and all our small, miserable, parochial notions disappear. If we have been living much in the presence of God, the first thing that strikes us is a smallness of the lives of men and women who do not recognize God. It did not occur to us before their lives seem to be broad and generous. But now there seems such a fuss of interests that have nothing whatever to do with God's purpose and are altogether unrelated to the election of God. It is because people live in the, in the things they possess instead of in their relationship to God that God at times seems to be cruel. There are a thousand and one interests that God provincially hand, provincial hand, has to brush aside as hopelessly irrelevant to his purpose. And if we have been living in those interests, we are, <laughs> we go with them. See Luke 12, 15. The Lord has called me from the womb, Isaiah 49, 1. And this rugged phrase, Isaiah declares the creative purpose of God for Israel and Judah. Creation has the opposite meaning of selection. The essential pride of Israel and Judah and the Pharisees in our Lord's day was that God was obliged to select them because of their superiority to other nations. God did not select them. God created them from for one purpose to be his bond slaves. There were no nations until after the flood. After the flood, the human race was split up into nations, and God called off one stream of the human race in Abraham and created a nation out of that one man in Genesis 12 too. The Old Testament is not a history of the nations of the world, but the history of that one nation in secular history, Israel is disregarded as being merely a miserable horde of slaves, and justly so from the standpoint of the historian. The nations to which the Bible pays little attention are much finer to read about, but they have no importance in the redemptive purpose of God. His purpose was that the creation of a nation to be his bond slave that through the nation, all the other nations should come to know him. The idea that Israel was a was magnificently developed type of nation is a mistaken one. Israel was a despised and despicable nation, continually turning away from God into idolatry, but nothing ever altered the purpose of God for the nation. The despised element is always a noticeable element in the purpose of God. When the Savior of the world came, he came of that despised nation. He himself was a despised and rejected by men. Isaiah 53, 3. In all Christian enterprise, there is the same despised element. Things that are despised, God has chosen. 1 Corinthians 1, 28. The realization by regeneration of the election of God and of being made thereby perfectly fit for him it's the most joyful realization on earth. When we are born from above, we realize the election of God. Our being regenerated does not create it. When we realize that through the salvation of Jesus, we are made perfectly fit for God, we understand why Jesus is apparently so ruthless in his claims, why he demands such rectitude from saints. It's given us the very nature of God. The creative purpose of God for the missionary is to make him or her his servant, 
one in whom he is glorified. When we realize this, all of our self-conscious limitations will be extinguished in the extraordinary blaze of what redemption means. We have to see that we keep the windows of our souls open to God's greater purpose for us and not confuse that purpose with our own intentions. Every time we do so, God has to crush our intentions and push them to one side. However, however it may hurt, because they are on the wrong line, we must beware lest we forget God's purpose for our lives. The election of the perfect finish for God. God elected a certain nation to be his bond slave. And through that nation, the knowledge of his salvation is to come to all the world. The history of that nation is a record of awful idolatry and backsliding that remain true neither to God's prophets nor to God himself. But in spite of everything, the fulfillment of God's purpose for the nation of his choice is certain. The election of the nation by God was not for the salvation of individuals. The elect nation was not to be the instrument of salvation to the whole world. The story of their distress is due entirely to their deliberate determination to use themselves for a purpose other than God's. The beginning of their corruption was their desire to have a king and to be like other nations. No, but we will have a king over us that we also may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. 1 Samuel 8, 19-20 Whenever Israel sought to use themselves for their own purpose, God smashed up those purposes. We must be careful not to confuse the predestination of God by making his election include every individual or to have the idea that because God elected a certain nation through whom his salvation was to come, that every individual of that nation is elected in salvation. The history of the elect nation disproves this, but it does not alter God's purpose for the nation. Individuals of the elect nation disprove this, but it does not alter God's purpose for the nation. Individuals of the elect nation have to be saved in the same way as individual nations that have not been elected. Election refers to the unchangeable purpose of God, not to the salvation of individuals. Each individual has to choose which line of predestination to take, God's line or the devil's line. Individual position is determined by individual choice, but that is neither here nor there in connection with God's purpose for the human race. Individuals enter into the realization of the creative purpose of God for the human race by being born again of the Spirit. But we must not make the predestination of God for the race to include every individual any more than God's predestination for the elect nation included every individual. Salvation is of universal application, but human responsibility is not done away with. The purpose of God for mankind is that we should glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Sin has switched the human race off onto the other line, but does not alter God's purpose for the human race in the tiniest degree. The election of the perfect fitness for God of the human race is abiding. It is exhibited in the man Christ Jesus. And that is the ideal the human race is destined to reach in spite of all that sin and the devil can do. The measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Ephesians 4.13 As Son of Man, Jesus Christ mirrors what the human race is to be like on the basis of redemption. Sin and the devil may do their worst, but God's purpose will only be made manifest all the more gloriously. Romans 5, 12 through 21. Preparation of the missionary's characteristic. He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. Isaiah 49, 2. The outstanding characteristic of the Asian people of God, of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
<sighs> and of the missionary is the prophetic or preaching characteristic. In the Old Testament, the prophet's calling is placed above that of king and of priest. It is the lives of the prophets that prefigure the Lord Jesus Christ. In character, the character of the prophet is essential to his work. The characteristic of God's elected purpose in the finished conditions of his servant is that of preaching. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Notice the emphasis that the New Testament places on confessing, and on preaching, and on testifying. All expressive of this perfect finish for God. And notice, too, that it is this characteristic that Satan attacks. He is at the back of the movement abroad today, which advocates living a holy life, but don't talk about it. People never suffer because they live godly lives. They suffer for their speech. Humanly speaking, if our Lord had held his tongue, he would not have been put to death. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. John fifteen twenty two. A saint is made by God. You made me. Then do not tell God he is bungling workmen. Is a bungling workman. We do that whenever we say I can't. To say I can't literally means we are too strong in ourselves to depend on God. I can't pray in public. I can't talk in the open air, substitute, I won't, and it will be nearer the truth. The thing that makes us say I can is that we forget that we must rely entirely on the creative purpose of God and on this characteristic of perfect finish for God. Much of our difficulty comes because we choose our own work. Oh well, this is what I am fitted for. Remember that Jesus took a fisherman and turned him into a shepherd. This is symbolic of what he does all the time. Indoor work has to do with civilizations. We were created for outdoor work, both naturally and spiritually. The idea that we have to concentrate our gifts to God is a dangerous one. We cannot consecrate what is not ours, 1 Corinthians 4, 7. We have to consecrate ourselves and leave our gifts alone. God does not ask us to, to do the thing that is easy to us naturally. He only asks us to do the thing that we are perfectly fitted to do by grace. And the cross will always come along that line. The election of the perfect fittedness to God. Israel is still in the shadow of God's hand. In spite of all of her wickedness, God's purposes are always fulfilled, no matter how wide a compass he had may permit to be taken first. The plan of the missionary is concentrated. In the shadow of his hand, he has hidden me. Isaiah 49 2. As applied, to the saint, this phrase refers to the experience of knowing, not with a sigh, but with deepest satisfaction, that in all the world there is none but thee, my God, there is none but thee. The shadow of God's hand may seem to be the cruelest, most appalling shadow that ever fell on human life, but we shall find what the disciples found. The fear as they entered the cloud and suddenly they saw only Jesus with themselves. Mark 9, 8. Never misunderstand the shadow of God's hand. When he put us there, it is assuredly to lead us into the inner meeting of Philippians 3.10, that I may know him. The stern discipline that looks like distress and chastisement turns out to be the biggest benediction. It's the shadow of God's hand that keeps us perfectly fitted in Him. The kindness and the generosity of God are known when we come under the shadow of His hand. We may kick if we like, or fume 
and the fingers hurt, but when we stop kicking, the fingers caress to say, through the shadow of bereavement, I came to know God better. It's different from saying God took away my child because I loved him too much. That is a lie. And contrary to God of love, Jesus revealed. If there is a dark line in God's face to us, the solution does not lie in saying what is not true to fact, but in bowing our heads and waiting. The explanation is not yet. All that is dark and obscure just now will one day be as brilliantly and joyously clear as the truth about God we already know. The wonder our Lord's counsel is fear not. Hmm. Pretty good. That's it. So that ended on page 110. Alright. See ya.